So good morning. Thank you for joining us on our session on equity. Um, this session is on incorporating equity into local plans and community engagement. I'm Maggie Moore. I'm a senior planner at PSRC. Um, and we are conducting this series of Passport to 2044 sessions really to um, help share resources and guidance on the local comprehensive plan um, periodic update process. So this is our first session on equity. We are planning to hold a second session on equity in early 2023. We'll provide more information on that later. Um, and we have many other passport sessions. So, so far we have held five different sessions. Starting in June, we had an overview on comprehensive planning. And then we've had a few more this year and we have a few coming up too. So next week we are holding a session on coordination with tribes. Uh, then later in November, I'm um, planning for critical areas, uh, as well as one on TOD and centers in early December. And then we'll have more in 2023, and we're starting to roll out the dates of those. If you weren't able to attend one of our past sessions, the recordings for those sessions, as well as all of the materials, are available on our website. But today we are focused on equity. So we're starting off today's session with some welcoming remarks and introduction. Uh, including from Charles Patton, our equity manager. Uh, then we'll talk about resources for equity in local comprehensive plans. We are joined by Natasha Walters from the city of Shoreline to talk about the incorporation of equity into their draft transportation element. Then we'll talk about engaging communities. Uh, and we have Brooke Broad from the city of Bellevue to talk about their community engagement work. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So just as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. All of the presentations will be shared after the meeting. So if you're not able to make the whole thing or someone you know wasn't able to make it, they'll be able to watch it later on. If you have a question, you can ask it in the Q&A and we'll have multiple times for Q&A throughout today's event. So go ahead and ask your questions there. And then please stick around until the end of our session. We'll have a short survey that will be prompted once the session ends. Um, just asking some demographic questions so we know who's joining us today. So I'm going to jump us into this, uh, why PSRC uh, is doing these passport sessions and our role in local comprehensive plans. We really want to help um, you create local plans that advance our regional goals. So a lot of time and energy was spent in developing Vision 2050 really as a shared regional vision. So we want to uh, be a resource in developing those plans that really continue on that regional vision. Uh, and there's some big key policy themes that come from Vision 2050. So increasing housing choices and affordability. We had a session on housing recently, and we're going to have another one in early 2023. Providing opportunities for all, so really a big emphasis on equity and racial equity, which we'll talk about more today. Um, and the growth strategy of growing in centers and near transit, um, really these big policy themes from vision. PSRC has a plan review manual that really outlines what's in vision and um, what we're looking for when we're reviewing local comprehensive plans, really providing um, that bridge between the two. We held a webinar on this in 2021. This is a really great resource. If you're diving into that update and wanting to look through that checklist. Um, and those have a variety of different resources in them. Uh, we've highlighted what's new in there. So if you're looking at your existing comprehensive plan and looking at what to update, these are great areas of emphasis to look for. And these include a lot of themes around equity. So these will be talked more about more in a presentation later this morning. We also have other resources from PSRC in addition to the plan review manual. Um, we have all of the our multi-county planning policies compiled into one document, as well as a matrix of what's different between Vision 2040 and Vision 2050. So a lot of helpful resources available on our website. We're also releasing various guidance documents and resources specific to different policy areas. So a lot of these have been in conjunction with these various Passport to 2044 sessions. Uh, so, for example, we have a resource on equitable engagement, which will be talked about today. We also have one on TOD and centers. 
um, coordination with tribes, and we have more that are coming out in the future. Also on our website are all past, past certification reports. Um, so what that looked like during the last round of plan updates, those are really helpful too as you're diving into your local plans. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Charles Patton who will talk about the importance of including equity into local planning, as well as PSRC's regional equity strategy. Great, thank you, Maggie. I'll get us started very shortly. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> all right, good morning. Glad to be with you all this morning. My name is Charles Patton. I'm the program manager for equity policy and initiatives. Um, I'll be sharing how we define, I'll start us off by sharing how we define equity at PSRC just to get us off on the, on the same page. I'll also talk about why it's important to uh, incorporate equity into the planning process. And I'll also share an overview of our regional equity strategy, which many of you know uh, will serve as a suite of tools and resources that will hopefully allow you to more effectively incorporate equity into those comp plan updates. So let's start with how we define equity. Uh, PSRC defines equity as all when all people have the means to attain the resources and opportunities that improve their quality of life and enable them to reach their full potential. When differences in life outcomes cannot be predicted by race, class, or any other identity. And when communities of color, historically marginalized communities, and those affected by poverty are engaged in decision-making processes, planning, and policymaking. Uh, before I dive into the overview of our regional equity strategy, I'd like to share a little bit about our region and the relevance of equity to the work that we do. Um, as many of you are well aware, our population is growing, projected to move, as you can see, from 4.3 million people in 2020 to a little under 6 million people by 2050. And much of that growth is the result of a growing population of people of color. About a quarter of the region's population was represented by people of color in 2000. That number jumped up to almost a third in 2010 and surpassed 40% by the time 2021 rolled around. And although we are growing in diversity, which is great, uh, we can also note that there is a clear difference in how people experience the systems that we help manage and shape based on their race. Opportunity mapping is a tool that we use at PSRC that illustrates which neighborhoods are and are not rich in resources, such as high quality schools, parks, living wage jobs. And it also assesses who has access to these areas and who has access to these resources. This slide that I have for you uh, really highlights some of the findings from the opportunity mapping resource. Here you'll note that people of color are more likely to live in areas of lower opportunity, uh, simply meaning they have less access to quality schools, less access to parks, less access to living wage jobs. And as you can see, about six out of 10 of our American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander households live in these lower opportunity communities. Jurisdictions have begun to recognize the severity of these disparities and the need to address equity in their plans and their policies. Um, but they have also noted that there is currently a lack of clear mandates, um, relatively little guidance, best practices, and tools. And consequently, equity is often a secondary consideration. Our hope is that the regional equity strategy can help address some of these concerns that were raised by our members in the 2016 Taking Stock Survey. Additionally, House Bill 1220 and the bipartisan infrastructure law are requiring jurisdictions to be more thoughtful about equity issues and undoing past harms. Because of this, elected officials are probably asking you to address equity, and if they haven't, uh, they likely will in the near future. The regional equity strategy will hopefully make this a little easier for you to address. So I've mentioned race uh, quite a bit during these initial slides. Uh, Maggie has also mentioned race. And some of you may be wondering why uh, PSRC is mentioning race. Why are we leading with race in this equity work? Uh, there is no neutral in this work that we're doing. Attempts to be race neutral and leave race out of the conversation have only led to continued barriers 
for communities of color with persistent disparities across any indicator that you want to look at from housing to economics to transportation to health due to a history of policies that have marginalized communities of color such as redlining restrictive covenants urban renewal so forth and so on and here you can see some of the disparities that have resulted from these policies. You can see that we have home ownership rates here, about two out of three white residents own a home in our region, while only about a quarter of our native Hawaiian Pacific Islander residents own a home in our region. And if we take a look at median income, we can note that white residents are a little over $90,000 in our region, which is almost double what American Indian Alaska native residents are in our region. Now, some may look at those slides and say, isn't this just really about income? Wouldn't we address these issues by focusing on income inequality rather than bringing up race? However, even after controlling for household income or in other words, evaluating differences in home ownership for households that are in that same income category, we can see that home ownership rates for people of color are much lower than rates for white households, especially in that lower income category. This really highlights that if we truly want to address inequities in our region, we need to focus not only on income, but race as well. Focusing on racial equity and considering race in all the dimensions of our work not only provides us with the opportunity to address the unique circumstances of marginalized racial groups, but it also introduces a framework, tools, and resources that can remove barriers for other marginalized racial groups, or marginalized groups, I should say. Um, since our vision at PSRC is to have a region where everyone is thriving, it's imperative that we improve outcomes for, for marginalized racial groups and close gaps so that race and other demographic factors don't continue to predict life outcomes. So in response to these disparities and the needs of our jurisdictions, we have begun the process of creating a regional equity strategy. The purpose of the strategy is to center equity in our work to improve outcomes for marginalized communities by providing a suite of tools and resources that can be used by our staff at PSRC, as well as by our members. Um, as you all know, PSRC reviews and certifies local plans. Maggie went through that. We have a checklist that helps identify everything that we're looking for in this process. And this is where we determine if the equity elements that we're hoping to see are included in your plan. So the checklist is essentially a tool for local planners to understand what we're looking for. The regional equity strategy will provide some additional information to help jurisdictions understand what we're expecting specifically as it relates to equity, providing this extra level of detail to help inform how equity is actually woven into your local plan. In anticipation of all of this, during the summer and fall of 2019, PSRC undertook an informal scoping process. And during these discussions, we explored board members stakeholders, staff, and community members' thoughts on issues related to equity and what should be included in a regional equity strategy. So the regional equity strategy will seek to address the issues identified during the scoping process through the following four key component categories, those being capacity building, data and research, community engagement, and best practices. I won't address every uh, resource in the regional equity strategy for the sake of time. Today, we'll solely focus on the resources relevant to the comp plan update process that I have highlighted for you on this slide. In the category of data and research, we have our equity tracker. This is going to be a public facing dashboard that will allow PSRC members to track progress on relevant equity related goals and policies. It also allows communities to hold us accountable as we attempt to create a region where race is less likely to predict life outcomes. And lastly, it allows us to provide some technical assist assistance to some of our members that may have limited resources and smaller staffs. Additionally, we have our Legacy of Structural Racism Interactive Report. This report will provide a historical overview of structural racism in the Puget Sound region and how this history informs ex existing disparities related to transportation, housing, economics, so forth and so on. Our hope is that we can provide a better understanding of the region's history to help inform member jurisdictions about the root causes of current racial gaps, which will help shape strategies that can, affect, can effectively address the consequences 
of these past harms. There were several requests to create an equity advisory um, committee to help center equity in all the work that we that we do, and that's exactly uh, what we've done. We currently have an equity advisory committee that consists of 19 members, both residents as well as staff from governmental and community-based organizations with expertise in equity rooted in their lived experience as well as from working um, or having an educational background in this field. Um, they have co-created the regional equity strategy with us. Um, so everything that I'm sharing with you today, they've had their fingerprints all over. Additionally, they've been advising PSRC staff and boards on policies and programs, bringing an equity lens to those conversations. We also have are planning to create an anti-displacement organization report. As many of you know, these organizations develop locally appropriate community-driven solutions for displacement. Uh, we're working to identify these groups and connect them to our member jurisdictions so we can help elevate this very important work. We're also uh, interviewing community-based organizations that work on anti-displacement effort, efforts across the region to explore potential strategies that we can share with our members to support these efforts. Uh, lastly, in regards to community engagement, we have our equitable engagement guidance. Um, this is available right now on our website. It provides guidance on how to engage residents that have historically been underrepresented in planning efforts, helping you leverage the insights of communities most impacted by policies and plans. Uh, the strategies included in this guidance will provide uh, insight on how to move beyond simply informing community members to actually consulting, involving, and collaborating with them. And moving on uh, to our last bucket, uh, our last theme from that scoping process, uh, best practices, uh, we have our racial equity impact assessment. This tool is designed to explicitly incorporate equity into the decision-making process for policies and plans. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. It's um, also referred to as a racial equity toolkit. There's essentially a series of questions that are asked that help reduce inequities by encouraging the user to conduct community engagement to address potential blind spots that they may have. It helps the user identify gaps as well as disparities and, and find strategies to address both those gaps and disparities. And it also encourages the user to develop a structure to hold themselves accountable for this work. So something akin to an equity tracker. Lastly, we have our equity planning resources, which you'll hear about shortly from uh, Liz and Aaron. Uh, this is a guidebook that will support jurisdictions in developing equity related strategies to reduce disparities related to housing, transportation, and other policies and planning. Uh, the guidebook will include a range, of uh, a range of strategies that are relevant to PSRC members' local context. Um, although many of the resources that I just shared with you are on the horizon, um, we have a number of equity related resources that are currently available on our website, and you can find them using the links in the bottom right hand corner of this slide. And now um, I will pass it on to Liz and Aaron, who will share some more details about one of the resources under the umbrella of the regional equity strategy, our equity and planning resources. Great. Thank you. I will share our presentation here. Great. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, I'm Liz Underwood Boltman. I'm a principal planner with our growth management planning team. Um, I'm joined by Aaron Hogan, who's with our transportation planning group. Uh, and we have been working on um, equity planning resources for comprehensive plans. Um, so before I get started, we did have a poll question. Um, Michaela, I'm wondering if you could launch our poll question now. Great. Um, so just understanding kind of a, the lay of the land of kind of where you're at in terms of your, your local plan. So does your jurisdiction's current comprehensive plan have policies related to equity? So yes, throughout the plan. Um, yes, but it could be more robust. Um, no, or not, a, not, not applicable if you're from a, a different agency or from um, a member of the public. So I'll we'll give you a moment to um, respond. Um, help us understand what's where, kind of where you're, where everyone's at. Okay, maybe Michaela, if you want to close the poll. Okay, great. Um, so uh, looks like we've got a lot of folks that identify that their policies could be more robust or that they don't include policies currently. So a lot of opportunity to address this issue in your local plan updates. So if we want to close the poll here, um, we'll get started. 
Um, so as Charles uh, discussed, um, equity has really um, expanded uh, focus area of Vision 2050. So it was expanded throughout the plan. So we don't have a standalone equity chapter, but uh, it's really woven through all the um, policy chapters as part of Vision 2050. Um, we also did an equity analysis that was part of our environmental review, um, which I might touch on a little bit more in a moment. Um, and we did several um, kind of data resources, including updated displacement risk mapping and opportunity mapping, which are also, I think, useful resources for local governments as part of this plan update. Um, as Charles mentioned, um, House Bill 1220 and new uh, requirements under the Growth Management Act really put a lot more focus and uh, attention on equity um, and displacement and exclusion as part of the plan update. So uh, we'll really be, um, I think, an important area of emphasis for this plan update. Um, Charles talked a bit about the relationship of planning and equity or inequity. So um, I hope hopefully folks are, are aware that equity has that um, planning has a history of um, some overtly discriminatory practices, but also trying to understand that um, that uh, inequities have been perpetuated um, through more subtle and pervasive practices like excluding marginalized voices and decision making um, and coded language that ex that um, that communicates a message of bias or exclusion. Um, but I think what we also see as part of um, planning is really um, a big opportunity to um, expand opportunities for everyone and address equity and mobility um, and access to housing, access to parks and open space, and across the board in terms of the services local governments provide. So um, a lot of opportunity as well. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about just uh, kind of a general way to sort of think about how you might look at um, addressing equity as part of your plan update. Um, the Washington State Department of Commerce is working on new guidance from um, related to House Bill 1220 and focusing particularly on housing and racially disparate impacts. But I thought this framework was really a sort of a helpful way to think about equity and sort of other part in other ways as part of other plan elements as well. Um, so understanding your community, so looking at demographics, um, understanding kind of like who lives in your community or who doesn't live in your community, um, analyzing the data and understanding um, bias or disparities that may exist in your as part of um, different uh, plan focus areas, um, evaluating policy on, on how they may contribute or um, or uh, change in sort of the sort of conditions related to disparate impacts or um, inequities, uh, revising policies, revising and reviewing regulations, um, of course, informed by community engagement throughout. So I think this is um, a probably this basic framework, but an, a nice way to sort of think through how you may uh, address equity as part of different types of plan elements. Um, I think we recognize that, especially for a comprehensive plan that addresses a variety of policies across a whole suite of uh, issue areas, it can be really challenging to do something like a plan level analysis, but I um, just wanted to provide you with some opportunities if, if that's something that you're interested in looking at as part of your work. Um, just some local examples that we've seen. Um, I think the city of Redmond has a nice way of sort of walking through um, a series of questions related to their comprehensive plan elements and policies um, to identify ways that uh, policies or elements can positively serve historically marginalized communities, uh, how it can address pro equity opportunities or reduce disparities. Um, so just a nice series of questions to sort of think through as um, staff are evaluating different plan elements. Um, City of Seattle has also done a racial equity analysis at their previous Seattle 2035 plan. Um, and as part of one of the sub-area plans for King County Skyway, there's a, a, a also a look at certain equity impact review. So um, I think it can be obviously challenging to look sort of wholesale across your plan, but um, there may be opportunities as you look at individual elements um, or consider. Um, we're also very excited to see new ways of doing this work too. So um, we'd love to see new examples as part of this plan update process to um, evaluate equity. Um, also from the Department of Commerce, their racially disparate impact guidance, um, a, a look at uh, kind of a policy level analysis. So um, a kind of a framework to that you can use to go through different policies as part of other types of plan elements to identify policies that may be supportive and helping to address uh, disparities or disparate impacts. Um, policies that um, may not be quite sufficient to address the gaps or barriers that you may have in place. Um, policies that may uh, challenge your ability to actually address equity as part of your plan or policies that are not ap applicable. So um, kind of a nice sort of framework to think through how you might, um, how policies are supporting or um, 
challenging your objectives. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, as part of the plan level analysis, uh, we did do um, an equity analysis for both uh, the re our regional transportation plan and Vision 2050. So those are also uh, resources if you want to see kind of how we approach doing kind of a plan level uh, look at equity. Um, but I'm going to pass it over to Aaron to talk more about um, some of the resources that we're working on. Thanks, Liz. Um, so as Charles mentioned, developing equity planning resources is a piece of the regional equity strategy that PSRC has been working on. Um, so it, as a first step to that, um, we've reviewed a lot of resources that are already existing. Um, for planning for equity, integrating equity into comprehensive plans, sub-area plans, um, as well as transportation plans. Um, so the, this slide has a couple examples of, of some of the resources uh, that we reviewed, but coming out of Vision 2050 and looking to the implementation of Vision 2050, as well as the regional equity strategy, um, we recognized there was an opportunity to develop um, really tailored resources um, for this region that relate to the requirements here in Washington state, as well as the direction from Vision 2050. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk to you about a little bit today. Uh, next slide, please. So as Liz mentioned, um, uh, uh, as well as Mag, you, you've heard this probably several times in these passport sessions, we have um, a plan review manual um, as part of the plan certification process that PSRC uses um, as a tool to review um, all of your comprehensive plans. Um, and uh, again, as mentioned earlier, there are several um, items in the checklist for comprehensive plans that are new from Vision 2050. And you'll probably notice several of those um, specifically call out leading with racial equity and incorporating that into plans. And so um, we've developed some regional uh, or some equity resources um, organized by these vision policy areas um, to help really answer the question of, of how to go about um, accomplishing the direction in Vision 2050 and the the items on the checklist. Um, next slide, please. So um, we've listed out um, sort of seven areas. We've kind of grouped together um, a couple of the ones that go together um, from vision, uh, but we've really organized the equity planning resources guidance, um, which is, a, again, a forthcoming document. Um, we're going to highlight a couple of examples from it today, uh, but there will be there will be more coming out um, for you to reference, um, but we've organized it in uh, by the policy areas. So I'm going to kind of give an overview um, um, of all of them. And then uh, Liz and I will be calling out some specific examples. So uh, the ones that are marked here with the little arrows are the examples we're going to go over today. Um, so to begin with the regional collaboration section, um, this part, this uh, component of vision calls for um, cities to prioritize access to opportunity to address past inequities. Um, looking at the environment and climate change sections, which we've kind of paired together, uh, but both are addressed. Um, two of the things that are being called for are access to a healthy environment and prioritizing the reduction of impacts to vulnerable populations. Um, and we'll be talking about that one in a little bit more detail uh, later as well. Um, for growth and development patterns, um, there's a lot here. Um, so we've kind of uh, grouped these into the categories of access to opportunity, um, inclusive engagement, which again, you'll be hearing about uh, in a presentation later today, as well as um, health disparities and um, how to address those uh, through the planning process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for uh, housing, which you have heard a little bit about um, in past uh, passport sessions, um, some of the major topics highlighted in our equity planning resources are um, addressing residential displacement, um, as well as examining home ownership with a focus on the historic inequities um, in who is, is able to uh, and can afford to own homes, um, as well as the racially disparate impacts um, and historic exclusion, how to proactively address those things. Um, and again, sort of addressing past inequities. Um, and then next, moving on to the economy section, um, we will, uh, we've talked a lot about um, 
displacement, but there's also commercial displacement. Um, so you'll see a lot to do with that in the economy section, as well as barriers for economically disadvantaged communities. Um, and then in transportation, um, two of the major themes we're exploring are mobility choices for all, as well as placing racial and social equity as a core objective of providing transportation services. And then finally, um, for the public services section of vision, looking at how to create equitable access to the public services uh, being provided in each jurisdiction. Uh, next slide, please. And now I'm going to pass it over to Liz um, to kick us off with our first example. Great. Um, so the regional collaboration chapter talks about prioritizing access to opportunity to address inequities. Um, and so we see that this can really be addressed through a number of different uh, ways of implementation through actions and programs, budgetary decisions, uh, community engagement at the local level. Um, Charles and I have both mentioned the idea of a racial equity impact tool. Um, one of these tools can be, I think, an effective way to evaluate policy um, as part of sort of future implementation as part of your plan updates. Uh, we will be having another passport session in 2023 that talks more about a racial equity impact tool, but um, there are several examples that are already available um, from the, the Government Alliance Fund Race and Equity. Um, King County also has a tool. Um, we also see some useful uh, data resources that could help address and, and inform this issue just to understand sort of the demographics of your community through essential, essential census data, um, as well as some of the opportunity mapping that we've done to understand um, areas of high, uh, high or low opportunity as part of your community. Uh, we also have a, a number of different uh, resources on demographics um, as part of PSRC's work. Um, so one, some of the work that um, Aaron and I have been doing in terms of um, planning guidances or resources is um, looking through local plans and trying to identify um, existing policies that um, could be, I think, a useful reference as, as some of the, in, in some of the work that you're doing. Um, we're always looking for more examples. And so um, these are really should be thought of as, I think, a starting point for your work to understand what might be um, useful for your particular community. But I uh, wanted to highlight a couple of examples from Burien as well as City of Seattle. Um, Seattle really focuses in their plan on um, a commitment to um, opportunities for inclusive and equitable community engagement, um, as well as really promoting race and social equity as part of their um, work as a city government. So um, we see that this is really helpful in terms of understanding kind of a holistic efforts to promote race and social justice. Um, Burien has, uh, I think, a good example on incorporating the idea of a, a race and equity toolkit. Um, so using a sort of structured uh, questions uh, as part of an equity impact analysis to um, help support future decision makings that the city is doing. So um, a couple examples there. Um, under uh, land use and housing, looking at residential displacement, um, vision calls for developing anti-displacement strategies when planning for residential growth. Um, so uh, displacement can include uh, kind of physical displacement when buildings deteriorate or economic displacement, which I think is the thing that I think many jurisdictions are focusing on as costs rise across the community. Um, communities of color, low-income communities, renter neighborhoods uh, tend to be at a higher risk for displacement. Um, so we have a couple examples of resources that um, are available. Um, PSRC is a housing innovations program toolkit um, that includes a number of strategies uh, organized around mitigating residential displacement. Uh, Commerce's housing action plan uh, also provides guidance that includes a number of different strategies that can help address um, displacement. Uh, we, of course, have um, our existing uh, displacement risk mapping resource, but um, as part of Commerce's forthcoming disparate impact um, impacts guidance, they also include some measures that you can look at for your individual community to help supplement that particular work on um, displacement. Um, some of the examples that we've seen, again, from um, Burien, as well as from the city of SeaTac, um, identifying and, and sort of take the city taking an opportunity to um, develop a, a equity and social justice toolkit that identifies strategies that look at both residential as well as commercial displacement, um, as well as working with um, other housing partners like the South King Housing and Homelessness Partnership um, to address housing and homelessness in the, in, uh, the urban center. Um, City of SeaTac includes some policies specific to mobile home parks, which are can be areas that are particularly at risk to development pressure. So a couple examples there. Um, I'm going to pass back to Erin to talk about climate. Thanks, Liz. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, um, 
We've kind of grouped together the climate and environment sections for planning resources, acknowledging that there's um, some overlapping areas between the two. Um, the example we're gonna talk about today is addressing impacts to vulnerable populations that are affected by climate change. Um, in addition to traditional environmental justice and um, examination of uh, the impacts of environmental hazards, um, there's increasingly a recognition that climate change is disproportionately uh, affecting um, populations. Um, and again, there's some um, intersection here with previous land use decisions um, that have placed people of color and low income populations in geographies that are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Um, so some of the resources that we've um, identified include um, the EPA's uh, Climate Change and Social Vulnerability Report. Um, and then uh, for the data resources to really dive into this data and analyze um, what's going on in your community specifically. Uh, the Washington Department of Health has created um, a digital environmental health disparities map, um, as well as PSRC has our uh, Puget Sound hazards map that really um, kind of touches on more of the environmental side of this. Um, so you can really uh, see that um, in a uh, the geographic um, component to this work. Um, next slide, please. Um, a couple of the examples that we pulled for um, this particular item um, are from the Everett Comprehensive Plan as well as the City of Tacoma's Comprehensive Plan. Um, some uh, There's a lot of text to these policies, but sort of in summary, in um, Everett's plan, they uh, specify that vulnerable populations are disproportionately suffering from health impacts due to climate change, as well as identify specific strategies and opportunities to address these impacts um, in implementation. And again, and considering how policies can really be carried forward to implementation is really important um, in the comprehensive planning process, um, as well as in the city of Tacoma, um, one of their environmental policies um, emphasizes the social equity impl implications of climate risks. So again, kind of um, explicitly calling out the impacts and the inequity of those impacts, as well as looking at how to um, address them. Next slide, please. Um, the next example we wanted to talk about was um, under the development patterns um, section of vision, we uh, talk a little bit about health disparities, um, acknowledging that um, disparities, uh, reducing health disparities can improve um, overall health outcomes. Um, so again, considering um, there's some overlap here with um, land use decision, environment, climate change, transportation, a lot of intersections um, here that lead to um, some health disparities uh, that can be addressed through planning. So some of the planning resources we identified um, were Tacoma Pierce County's Health Department has developed the Healthy Community Planning Toolbox, um, which has some great uh, resources um, that kind of have some local context to them. But we've also found that there are some um, sort of statewide and national resources from APA. Um, so there's the Planning and Community Health Resource, as well as Washington's APA chapters put together a resource guide for healthy community planning. Um, looking to some of the data resources that can support this work, um, there's the Washington Tracking Network um, helps track some of these factors um, that lead to health disparities, um, as well as um, community profiles. Uh, and you'll also notice local health departments are doing a lot of really good work in the region. Um, in addition to Tacoma Pierce County's uh, toolbox, the, um, our other health departments are also doing some really good work tracking this data and developing strategies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so some examples from existing comprehensive plans that um, we pulled out to talk about um, were Kenmore's comprehensive plan as well as King County's plan. Um, in the Kenmore plan, um, uh, within their land use section, actually, they emphasize reducing health disparities um, and do a really good job of focusing on the role of both the built and the natural environment in health outcomes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, again, there's a lot of intersections um, when talking about health disparities between policy areas. Um, and in King County's comprehensive plan, um, it also focuses on proactively addressing disparities through implementation. Um, again, similar to the last example, um, the more implementation can be addressed, um, the stronger the policy. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, and our final example is within um, the transportation policy area. Um, so um, one of the items you'll find in our plan checklist um, is ensuring mobility options for all people. Um, and so bringing an equity lens to transportation services and investments um, is really critical to ensuring that uh, the transportation system um, is, is serving the needs of historically marginalized and underserved communities, um, as well as looking at the um, sort of externalities and impacts of uh, transportation infrastructure projects um, and the impacts of those projects. So some of the planning resources we've identified here are from the Department of Transportation has a transportation equity um, center with several um, resources um, and suggested approaches, um, as well as the Center for Neighborhood Technology has a great tools for equitable mobility um, resource that's got some specific strategies. The Center for Urban Transportation Research out of Florida also has a transportation equity needs assessment and project prioritization study and associated tools um, that are, are really helpful for projects. Um, so data resources that can inform the analysis underpinning this work um, We've listed out some, P some PSRC examples coming out of the Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, PSRC has been doing a lot of data work in the transportation realm. So um, the transportation visualization tool that accompanies the Regional Transportation Plan has a lot of resources um, that can be helpful when developing the transportation component of your plan, as well as uh, PSRC's new data portal has some great um, equity population uh, geography layers um, that you can use to perform this analysis. Um, and then also referring to our regional coordinated mobility plan um, that kind of expands beyond just um, leading with racial equity to also looking at uh, people with disabilities, low income populations, um, youth uh, and other vulnerable populations. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so the two examples we pulled for this were um, from Tacoma's comprehensive plan as well as Seattle's. Um, so in Tacoma's plan, they really acknowledge the importance of modal transportation equity, uh, which often goes unacknowledged um, in the planning process. Um, and then again, creates an opportunity to use additional funding in historically underserved areas, which they refer to as sort of catch up investment. Um, so again, not just looking at how are we allocating funds moving forward forward, but how do we address past inequities? Um, and then in Seattle's plan, again, it clearly states racial equity as a factor in transportation investment decisions. And again, this is consistent with PSRC's um, leading equity with uh, racial equity approach. Um, and then I think our last slide is just uh, Liz and I's contact information, uh, but staying with that theme of the transportation policy area, I'm going to hand it over to Natasha Walters with the City of Shoreline, um, who's going to talk a little bit more about equity and transportation um, in their jurisdiction. Thank you very much, Erin. And I will apologize to everybody if I do not share my screen correctly. Let's see if I do this correctly here. Okay, is that working? Looks great. Excellent. Okay. Well, good morning. Um, I have I have just learned a tremendous amount um, in terms of what we can do with the city of Shoreline to continue to improve, which I think we all should just give ourselves a thumbs up for being here and, and working on this, and we all have opportunities for improvement. I'm I am the transportation services manager for the city of Shoreline. And we have um, just completed uh, the majority of, of development of uh, some of the, 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 the meat, so to speak, of our transportation update. So I, I uh, understand I have 10 minutes. I have 10, 11 slides. I'm going to be moving through them quickly. I also understand that those slides will be available on the website um, after this presentation. So for some background for folks, I understand we have people from all over the state. Welcome. Um, the city of Shoreline is directly north of the city of Seattle, adjacent to, um, if you've driven I-5 to Seattle from the north, you've gone through Shoreline. We're 12 miles, uh, square miles, 14 neighborhoods, uh, 57,000 residents, and I'll talk a little bit more about our, our demographic makeup. We're primarily um, single-family residential. We have I-5, and what's shown here is Aurora, or SR99, um, that go through basically bisecting the city. And we do have a majority of, of white residents, um, but we have 27% speaking language 
at home other in a language other than English, and 21% are foreign born. And I'll note that we have a lot of changes coming. Um, right here, you see a lot of trees, a single family residential, but we're very excited to have light rail coming back to the city of Shoreline. Years ago was the inner urban, but we have two stations coming back to the city. And those two uh, stations, we have a lot of transit already development coming in real time, kind of some people you would hear from our economic development manager exploding. And we have a lot of new families and new development coming on all, along Aurora right here. Multi-family development, a lot more um, uh, diversity is, is coming into our neighborhoods, which we're really excited about. And as a city, we have goals um, that reflect our, a priority for equity and social justice. Uh, we have a number of goals. We've talked about climate change and a number of other ones I've heard today as being important. But, but climate, excuse me, equity and social justice is an area of emphasis. We've got two uh, council resolutions that are encouraging us from the individual as a city of Shoreline employee, how we interact within the city as well with our, our community and with our stakeholders to have a lens towards um, equity. Um, and we're working on that in a number of different ways in the city. I'm highlighting here Black Coffee was one of my favorite places to go in the city of Shoreline. But we have a lot of different efforts, um, programs and actions to help um, to address equity and make sure we're doing a better job of it. It's always something we're striving to improve. I've highlighted our master plan here. I'm also going to note that last bullet, which is the comprehensive plan parts and master plan focused outreach. Um, we're excited. This is something that's, I'm going to say that transportation master plan we're mostly finished what, with, but that's kind of an early part of the comp plan. And as part of our comp plan update, we're going to be reaching out even more to communities, identifying community leaders to do engagement with. So we're going to take some of the, the things that, that we're learning from updates of other elements of our comprehensive plan and using them for our future work. So as I mentioned, we're almost through with our transportation master plan update. We're going to be finalizing in the spring of 2023. That has had multiple components, development of a vision, development of, of revisions of policies and programs, and as well as a um, investment priority project list, constrained financial list that we've been working on. We have six um, goals for that. And we talked about, well, should we make equity its own goal or should it be pervasive throughout all the goals? We decided to make equity its own goal because we really wanted to emphasize that that was an important aspect of what we were trying to achieve as we update our transportation master plan. And in terms of what we did for outreach, outreach to our stakeholders is continuous. Um, we've been, we had three major outreach series and with those series, we um, made sure that we were reaching out to communities. Uh, this is showing here, if you see my, my mouse, um, Seattle Chinese Times and La Raza uh, were some of the community newspapers. Um, campaign signs we found to be very uh, effective in terms of People actually on the on the road at the bus stop, the library, being able to see those. Um, we understood. I should back up. We went and looked at our census data, and we looked at what were the primary um, uh, languages other than English that were being spoken in the city. And understanding that, we went and and targeted um, that understanding that that Spanish and uh, Chinese were the primary languages and, and a host of other ones. We did some direct translations into Chinese and into Spanish. And then we have um, 12 other languages. I have a sentence saying, if you're interested in learning more, we can provide you translations um, into, um, into the language, your native language. And I'll note here, and it was great to hear this from PSRC staff. This is a lot of going, sharing information out. And what we're trying to do is also pull that information in. And that's something we're still trying to learn more about how to understand the priorities of the community. This is us asking them questions, trying to get it um, to, to understand, but we're, we're, we're sending it out from our um, sources. And what we like to also do more of is um, have more listening sessions in addition to these documents. And, and I will say that we had three virtual open houses that went with this. So as we developed um, our different elements, one of them was developing modal plans. So you have your pen plan, you have your bike plan, you have your um, transit plan, but that's for advocacy. And um, we have a level of service standards. We have a, a vehicle, vehicular modal plan. These are our graphics showing our different plans. 
Um, we got, we used community input. We did targeted input to the, to I just mentioned, as I show in Chinese and Spanish and trying to reach out to the communities. And I'll note that we actually went to elementary schools as well, trying to um, reach the, the younger, uh, younger folks as well in terms of getting that input. Um, and then we have a process, once we identified our, our goals and objectives, developing modal plans and project ideas. So we're looking at, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, um, looking at our transportation network, which the backbone is the roads typically, sometimes they're, they're pathways, but looking at what, we, um, what kind of improvements, sidewalk, transit, uh, improvements, bike, uh, do we wanna make um, coming up with a prioritized project list for investments. And then ultimately, we have a constrained, as well as unconstrained, financially constrained 20-year plan. And that's what I'm going to be talking more about, is what was our process for how we determine how to prioritize our projects. And that will be the next slide. There's a lot on this slide here. But basically, we took our transportation network and we um, segmented it into different um, um, one or more blocks for a roadway. And for each of these segments, we identified and described what kind of improvements we'd like. So this is showing the type of bike, bike improvements. So this is making it a, a low stress bike environment and sidewalk gaps. This is what we identified as some of the modal improvements that we could be doing. And then we had evaluation criteria, which I'll be focusing in on equity. And this was looking at a variety of metrics which reflected our goals, which were informed by the public, which, and again, we, we talked about um, community outreach is really important who you ask for that information. So we have our projects, we did evaluation criteria, and this you're not supposed to be able to read, <laughs> but this is basically taking one of these projects, running it through all these criteria, criteria um, scores, and we come up with a final score. And with that final score, um, we'll come up with a prioritized list of projects. So these are all the different metrics. Again, there's a slide on this, it'll be on the website um, that show how we took a segment of roadway and we looked at um, some of the, um, the metrics that were important to us. And we did for a segment of roadway, we looked at things um, such as for safety metrics, we looked at number of accidents and we looked at um, we have one for multimodality, so how close they were to a bus stop. And we had one specifically for equity, and that's one of the ones I'm going to really drill down on um, for this presentation. So for each project, in addition to looking at how is it doing on safety, how is it doing on connectivity, how is it doing on, on, on um, uh, multimodality, where was it? in terms of relationship to our underserved communities. So we used um, American Community Survey census block level data for each one of those segments and we looked at, in a block group. And for that, that segment of roadway for that project, I'll call it a project, um, we looked at how it scored in terms of how it was serving these communities, looking at age, looking at um, income, looking at communities of color, disabilities, and limited English speaking. And you got points, so to speak. Each one of these projects got points based on that. We didn't have, by the way, a block group that scored over 80% um, for each one of these categories, but we did have some higher ranking um, census block groups. Then we used that information, equity was one of those metrics, and we came up with our prioritized list of projects. This is showing are for those projects I showed, how they rated high, medium, and low, um, high being the red, yellow being the medium, green being the low, and in terms of the priorities for us um, as a city for investment. And I know I'm kind of going through this quickly. So let me just stop there. So this was our list that we used to come up with our financially constrained plan. We had a number of other things that we, we were looking at in terms of projects we committed to that were already federalized, but we were looking at how else we wanted to make our investments, how else we want to, not past tense, future tense, um, how we will make our investments. Um, this was how we um, are considering what is the highest priority. And then in terms of how we're doing, um, it's really great um, to uh, hear um, some other resources that we could be looking at 
So this is what I have so far for equity performance measures. Um, we're looking at, we just talked about those projects and where the investments are. And then we're looking at the number of projects that are being actually implemented within an equity priority area and the number of public engagement activities within a priority area. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about how we came up with these equity priority areas. It's not as sophisticated um, as what you've seen from PSRC and the city of Tacoma and others. It was basically, go to the next slide. We took our census block group level data for um, populations under 18, populations 60 and older, household income, people of color, people with disabilities and limited English speaking with the metrics of thresholds. And we created a composite map, um, recognizing that we could have done more weighting for one demographic versus another, um, that we could have looked at other metrics. This is our starting point. And I say that because um, we recognize there's a lot more work to do, but this composite map is showing where our priority our areas are for um, the underserved. And we're using that um, as, as starting point for looking as a, for performance measures in terms of how we're doing with our investments. So that is the, um, the, the baseline, so to speak. And we're gonna be looking as we continue with our comprehensive plan update and implementation um, to see how we can further improve that. So our next steps, as I said, we're not quite done with our um, comprehensive plan update yet. Are always doing uh, stakeholder engagement. I'm looking forward to hearing some more suggestions on how to do, do a more robust um, job with that as well. Um, we have a, some equity as well as other policies that we're looking to implement, looking to have prioritize implementation of those policies as well as those projects and then performance measures. Uh, and that whew, completes my presentation. Any questions? I think I just made nine minutes. <laughs> yeah, that was fantastic. And a lot of information in those nine minutes too. So thank you so much. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, we have time for a couple of questions during Q&A. So if anyone okay. wants to ask questions, you are welcome to do so now. Okay, so now I have to figure out how to stop sharing. <laughs> um, and so I will start the first question. There have been a lot of links throughout these presentations. Um, and there are also some future tools that Charles mentioned. So we will share all of the presentations will be posted on our website later on. Um, and we will send an email to everyone who registered for today's event. So if you're logged on now, you'll receive that email or um, others who weren't able to attend but registered. We'll send links to all of those. Also send a link to registering for our comprehensive planning newsletter, which will provi provide updates quarterly on um, new resources we're releasing. So that would be a great place to stay on top of those equity resources that Charles mentioned that are in the works, but not yet published. So before we go on to our next section, um, I just have a couple more questions to ask. Um, Charles, I think this one's a good one for you. So are Asians considered people of color? They seem to be doing better than whites in most of the indicators you showed um, on those data slides earlier. Really appreciate this question. Glad it was asked. Um, Asians, Americans are considered people of color. They have a history of marginalization from the Chinese Exclusion Act to Japanese internment, redlining of restrictive covenants also uh, marginalized many uh, Asian Americans in our region and across the country. Uh, and I think what really is highlighted by this question is a failure of our data and our the failure of our data to disaggregate um, these different groups and lump them into one. As we all know, uh, Asian Americans, as many uh, communities of color, are not monolithic groups. They have different experiences, unique experiences, and uh, something very unique uh, to the Asian American experience is their uh, immigration to this country and their paths to this country. Some arrive uh, through refugees as refugees, others arrive through visa programs. And as a result of that, they have different resources that they arrive to this country with and different barriers that they face as a result of that, those resources or those lack of resources. So if you disaggregate that data, you will often find that many communities of color or Asian American residents are, are marginalized, um, have uh, lower incomes, uh, lower rates of home ownership. Um, and I think that's something that we should also be thoughtful about as we are collecting data um, moving forward with this work, so. 
Thank you for the question. Great, thank you. Um, and Natasha, I've got a number of questions for you, so I'm going to go for it in our few minutes of this Q and A section. Sure. So the first one: How does Shoreline Balance improved equity center? transportation investments with the reality of existing businesses and housing, as well as future, the future possibility of displacement. I think looking at where people live now, where they might live in the future. Well, yeah, this is a great question that I think we're, we're asking ourselves as well. Um, in terms of where people are living in the future, where we are, we are setting aside a significant portion for of um, new um, multifamily for, um, I'll just simply say for the, for underserved communities, um, just uh, low income, um, it's not the right term, but we have a percentage that we're setting aside for, for, for these new neighborhoods that are coming into being in terms of, see, what was the rest of it? Displacement? Look at which question is it here? So, um. Do you see it? The second one on the list. So the shoreline balance improve equity. Yeah, uh, yeah. For uh, the reality of existing businesses, we are trying to attract and retain. I think that's that's our economic development manager is doing is is um, I think uh, aware and and working on that. Um, I think I talked about the future. So that's that's an ongoing um, conversation and and looking at the makeup of our businesses and and attracting new businesses we're, with our new neighborhoods and with multifamily you've got hopefully that opportunity for more um commercial so i don't have a have a spectacular answer i think it's something that we're cognizant of and working on and we're excited when we do attract and retain those um those those businesses and 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 trying to support those populations and existing in in new developments. Great, thanks. I think it also shows how interrelated the transportation element is to those other elements of the plan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then we do work closely with with our planning and economic development manager. So, what was the next question? Yeah. So, um, the I'm going to combine these two. Was this work done entirely in house, or did you use a consultant? Oh, that um, is such a great, sorry, go ahead, Maggie. You there's a second key. half, and then what was the breakdown between staff time and consultant time on there? It's always a great question. I need to, I need that answer myself. <laughs> um, I, I want to just actually, this gives me the opportunity to, to sh give a shout out to, this is a team effort, um, as, as all things are. Um, uh, we did, a, I think, a split. Um, Farron Pierce is our consultant for this. And we have some really great GIS staff as well, who frankly made this a priority. And we did budget some time to have GIS staff. I would say, because um, we're still working on this, but I don't want to get myself in trouble and have my staff saying, we spent more time than that. I think it was probably 50-50. Um, one of the advantages of using this, this uh, easily accessible American Community Survey block group data is it's there. And it's you, you're basically create you know into putting these layers together. It's not that complicated. We're not doing at this point a lot of waiting, a lot of of, of additional. I will say it's complicated to give recognition to our GIS staff, but the resources are there, and we can. I think this is part of the question on one of these. Yes, we can update the American Community Survey data as well as the other metrics that we use, and that was one of the things that we wanted to be able to to, to make sure we could do is have access to the all those different metrics and, and be able to update them as that data becomes available like every four or five years is when we're talking about updating. Fantastic. Okay, so that's all the questions we'll Thanks. do at this point. If you have more questions throughout the session, please ask them in the Q&A and we'll have a longer Q&A session towards the end. But for now, I'm going to pass it over to Gary Simonson and Noah Bodges from PSRC to talk about resources for conducting equitable community engagement. All right. Thank you, Maggie. Um, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Gary Simonson, a senior planner with PSRC's Transportation Planning Division. And uh, joining me today in this presentation is Noah Bogus. He's senior public engagement specialist uh, with PSRC. And so um, today we're going to be talking to you about um, developing or uh, implementing an equitable engagement process as you work to develop your comprehensive plans. And I do wanna note that 
we do have, I think as, as mentioned in a couple of previous presentations, we do have a guidance document that covers some of this same material uh, that's available um, on our webpage. And I believe there are links available to that um, in those presentations. And I think Noah, if you could put um, the that link in the chat as we discussed, that would be great. Um, okay, uh, next slide, please. So today we're gonna to be discussing um, um, four considerate four main considerations to look at uh, when you're um, trying to make your engagement public engagement process more equitable. Um, but before delving into those, I, I just want to kind of talk a little bit about the big picture. Um, obviously, we know community uh, engagement is important um, because um, you know these communities are directly impacted by the planning and policy decisions um, that jurisdictions make. Um, the communities, community members have sort of unique on the ground perspectives um, that planners and project managers may not be aware of. And unfortunately, historically, the communities that have been disproportionately impacted, most disproportionately impacted in a negative way, have not been as, as involved in the community engagement process. Um, so really these considerations are seeking to sort of address those blind spots that have existed in the past and um, that have allowed this to happen and to, again, try to establish a more equitable process. So um, first, um, so I'll just go through the, the four considerations here um, that we're gonna go into more detail on. Um, the first one is uh, identify communities most impacted and it's develop the right engagement strategy for your process. Then establish meaningful relationships with the public, with the communities in your jurisdiction. And finally, make engagement as easy as possible. And um, you can see here um, on the right side, there is a, uh, a, a sort of diagram that shows these are really all hap happening in sort of a cyclical manner. Um, there's overlap. Um, these all sort of propagate each other. And there's really a synergy when you do all these things together at the same time um, that allows your process to be, um, or that should allow your process to become um, more equitable. Um, so next slide, please. So first, um, identify community that communities that are most impacted. And why this matters is, as I mentioned, you know, planning practices historically have dis disproportionately impacted communities of color, uh, low-income communities, communities where English is not the primary language spoken, communities that happen to live in certain parts of your jurisdiction. Um, and these Im impacted communities have often been excluded for various reasons um, from the planning processes or have had their uh, input into the, into the process minimized. So in order to sort of try and correct this, um, the first thing, you know, if you wanna prioritize the input of those who are most affected by your planning decisions, it's critical to identify who these communities are and where they exist, where they live um, in your, within your jurisdiction. Uh, next slide. So some resources that are available um, to help you identify sort of who and where these communities are. First, we have PSRC's community profiles um, available through our webpage and linked here. Um, you can use these to better understand what exactly is the socioeconomic composition of your jurisdiction. There's also the Government Alliance on Race and Equity or GARES uh, Racial Equity Toolkit Assessment Worksheet. So this, can allow, this allows you to sort of delve further into the racial composition of your area and um, you know, see how the geography of your of racial demographics uh, in your jurisdiction look like. And then finally, as, as previously discussed, PSRC has um, opportunity and displacement risk mapping. So you can use this to identify um, you know, which parts of your, of your, of your jurisdiction have are, where the most opportunity exists which parts have the least, um, and then where there's the greatest risk um, for people to be displaced from their homes or businesses to be displaced. 
um, where that exists within your within your jurisdiction, and then um, identify who um, is most at risk. Uh, next slide, please. So in, for this one, you know, the, as you're kind of moving forward, some questions to consider, you know, are the populations that you've typically conducted outreach with, does that reflect the diversity of the, so the socioeconomic diversity of the communities um, that you serve? Um, are there areas in your jurisdiction that you see, you know, based on the, the, the tool that I just mentioned, the PSRC's um, displacement risk to other areas in your jurisdiction that are at a higher risk of displacement? Is it possible that planning decisions um, that you're making on growth and infrastructure can make that displacement risk worse? And then again, most importantly, who would be most impacted? Where are those people? And how can you make sure that they are a part of your, of your process? And one last thing I wanted to mention um, that I forgot to mention previously is another group that you know is greatly impacted by planning decisions that sometimes doesn't get included are youth. So it's important to, to consider and to make sure that you try and engage with um, the youth as well. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the next is developing the right engagement strategy for your process. So, you know, for your planning process, your projects, um, there's unique aspects and um, each, th th there's different types of engagement strategies that are, could potentially be the best fit for the unique sort of elements of your project and what you're trying to do. Um, one key element of that is um, level of engagement. How exactly are you going to be engaging with the community? And that's really based on the desired level of influence. So if you want the community to be involved and to have more of a say, then you're gonna have sort of a more higher touch engagement process um, that where the, the community is actually providing feedback and informing the process. Um, the, and then, you know, when you, it's important to develop the strategy upfront to sort of lay a foundation for the work that you're gonna be doing so you know what the appropriate resources that you need to dedicate are. That's in, both in terms of staffing, as well as other costs. Um, and you know, if it turns out, maybe you don't have the resources to do what you wanna do, you can adjust. Um, although I will say, you know, there, there are certainly, you know, there, there are some um, you know, outreach initiatives that can be costly and require a lot of staff, but there's, there's also a fair amount of no and low cost, or maybe no is a bit of a stretch, but low cost um, engagement uh, approaches out there as well to look into. Uh, next slide, please. So some tools that you can use here um, in terms of um, uh, engagement spectrums. So this is sort of what I, was, what I was talking about earlier. You can use these spectrums to communicate what are your expectations about the purpose of the process? What, what's the level of engagement that you, and the sort of impact and the influence that you want the community engagement to have on the project. So we have two links here. Um, the International Association of Public Participation has a public participation, excuse me, public participation spectrum. Uh, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council in Boston has what they call a community engagement recipe book. And really at the sort of high level, looking at all these spectrums, you know, on the, on the, on the one end, the sort of the low end of the spectrum, you've got simply making sure that um, the community is informed about, what, about what's happening, that they're aware in a timely manner. Um, then moving up the spectrum, there's actually, you know, it, it, engaging with the community in a way that allows them to provide feedback and input that influences the project or influences the planning process. And then finally, I guess on the, on the far end of the spectrum, you can have a, a collaborative approach where you're really working side by side with the public and making decisions um, together. So whatever you, you choose, um, it's important that you, um, you know, have, a, have a strategy for communicating to decision makers you know, um, what, what's happened. So upfront, you wanna make sure that your, your process has built into it the development of, you'll be developing clear documents and presentations that are, share, are able to share the engagement results with leadership, with decision makers. 
if possible, if you can invite community members, excuse me, community members um, to public meetings to share their view, that can be more impactful than just having staff relay that information, actually have the community there. And, and even better than that, if you can invite the decision makers to the community and events themselves, um, they can really um, see in a robust way sort of what different members of the community are saying and what their input and feedback on this um, planning process or project um, is. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so questions to consider, um, you know, first and foremost, what level of decision making are you planning and able to provide to the public? Um, what are the key milestones for decision making in your update process? And are you going to make sure that your sort of community engagement process aligns with that so that it's as sort of impactful as, as, as possible on the process? And then finally, um, you know, how much is this going to cost? And that includes, um, you know, any potential compensation for participants. And Noah's going to delve uh, a, a little more into compensation and some of the sort of considerations and things to think about there uh, in just a couple minutes. And actually, I'm going to hand it over to Noah now. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, establishing meaningful relationships and making engagement easy. Thanks, Gary, and hi, everyone. I'm Noah Bogus, Public Engagement Specialist uh, here at PSRC. So as Gary mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, the third and fourth sort of pillars of equitable engagement that we have put together for our guidance. So the third one here, establish meaningful relationships. Why is this important? The first bullet here just really talks about the importance of making authentic connections with communities that are most likely to be impacted by planning decisions. Um, we've talked a lot in this presentation and others about how far too often planning projects don't account for the individuals who are most likely to be impacted with them and establishing uh, relationships early and often um, is, is important to making sure that those sort of cycles are broken. The second bullet focuses all about building a foundation of trust and collaboration. We talk about this a lot as sort of the co-creation space of working with community members um, together to use their input um, in a project and, and make sure that you're establishing that trust and sense of rapport uh, to, to have a successful engagement process that leads ultimately to, to sound and smart planning. And the last bullet here talks about um, the more inclusive we can be with voices leads to stronger outcomes for all community members across the board. Um, strong communities benefit everyone and really focusing on bringing all of the voices to the table is gonna help everyone. So some strategies that we've put together to help establish these meaningful relationships um, and I'll also take a pause and say, not just establishing meaningful relationships, but maintaining those relationships is very important as well. Uh, it's important to, to check in with community-based organizations and, and people that you've spoken to, to um, just, just keep those lines of communication open and report back on how their input has shaped decisions. One of the first things that we recommend are community advisory committees, which are standing committees composed of individuals who can speak to a community's needs and challenges. A couple examples that we have down here are um, our equity advisory committee, which has been going for about a year now. And then there's a link to, to MR, MRSC has a list of different advisory boards and commissions. And kind of getting back to what I was saying about establishing and maintaining meaningful relationships, um, the first comment under there with standing committees is, is critical maintaining a regular schedule. Our committee meets um, monthly and just really starting to build in that habit of regular lines of communication and collaboration between community advisory committees is really important. So some questions to ask yourself as you look to provide meaningful relationships into your planning processes, in what ways are you dedicating funding and or staff time to establishing these relationships? It's not easy, and here at PSRC, there's a couple of us on the call um, right now, Charles, myself, that um, spend a lot of time working with our equity advisory committee and regularly making sure that we're putting, putting some of our work hours into keeping that open and operational. And if you choose to have an advisory committee in your community as well, those are some things that you'll need to think through about how you staff and maintain that. 
How are you valuing people's time, effort, and expertise? Are you really taking the committee's suggestions into account and reporting back on them, how that was uh, factored into some decision making? Um, or if not, why? Explain sort of the constraints that you have and what kind of um, what kind of comes from that impact in those relationships. And then lastly, in what ways are you working to build trust within impacted communities? Constantly coming back to, are we, um, are we being trustworthy partners and operating in good faith with these individuals? And the last one here that I'll spend quite a bit of time on um, is just make engagement easy. It's important to make engagement as easy as possible because it's, it makes it more likely that people will engage and, and participate in these processes. It sort of seems straightforward, but really putting some thought into how we as public officials and planners can make engagement easy was going to go a long way. The three bullet points for why this matters, impacted, computed, impacted communities are often not given that voice in planning decisions by making it as easy as possible for communities impacted to provide outreach and engagement and input. Um, it's just going to help them make sure that that they're being heard for 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 what they wanted to have seen in their communities and how we as planners can help facilitate that. Events are often held in inaccessible places or during times that are unavailable to a large group of people. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about strategies that can make sure that when you're holding events, you're you're making it as easy to attend those events as possible in a number of different um, strategies. And then lastly, going where historically impacted communities are and ensuring that events are successful and have um, multiple ways to participate is going to increase equity in your public engagement process. So some strategies to make engagement easy, make public meetings accessible, choose meeting locations, times and venues that make it accessible for communities. Um, this should be thinking critically about when you're having committees or, or when you're having meetings, excuse me. So um, if folks have different working hours or schedules, it's not just like an evening meeting. Uh, you want locations to be accessible and comfortable and interesting. Gary and I have talked a little bit about um, just sort of joking about what a public meeting looks like in a show like Parks and Recreation or something like that. Uh, and those often get off the rails. And there's a reason for that because they sort of only open themselves up to individuals who can come to a high school gym in the middle of the day or something like that. But really thinking critically about having different times for meetings, different locations um, that provide comfortable opportunities for people to provide input. Mm -hmm. We've put another link in here uh, from Mobility for All has an inclusive planning toolkit that can kind of help you structure some of these public meetings in a way that's more accessible. Tailoring your outreach preferences of identified communities is important as well. Making sure that materials are available in different languages that are appropriate for the communities you're doing outreach for. And then communicate using um, the mediums that are preferred by communities and using a different mix of marketing resources. This also ties back into the last thing I was talking about, our last pillar about establishing relationships. This is a good opportunity to lean on those relationships that you have with community members or community-based organizations and work with them and kind of figure out how people are communicating and what's the most efficient, effective, and equitable way to disseminate information to community members. Another strategy that we have is providing multiple ways to participate, um, thinking about how different social, economic, or cultural conditions might influence how people interact with others, which gets back to my previous point about doing the legwork and research to figure out how those conversations are taking place, and then providing different engagement options. We talked about meetings, but in-person and online open houses, um, having multiple options in case folks maybe can't come to an in-person event, and then thinking critically about um, are there specific focus groups that would help here, like business owners or nonprofit workers or something like that, or, or direct surveys and who those surveys um, should ultimately be reaching. Another strategy that Gary kind of talked about are compensation policies. Direct compensation is maybe the most um, uh, the, the most direct way to value the time and effort engagement requires um, by compensating people for their time. 
Uh, this link here to PSRC's compensation policy delves into that a little bit more, um, but our policy allows us to compensate individuals for completing surveys, participating in focus or work as working groups, uh, sitting on our committees, uh, or we can compensate individuals for interviews or community-based organizations as well. We've had a lot of questions about how um, we can provide compensation since we are a public agency, and I really encourage you to take a look at that policy because that's got the most specific language, but some best practices that we've had are there's specific language in there about if you are getting compensated by PSRC, you cannot be getting compensated by your um, employer during that same time, so really making sure that you're really volunteering your personal time to spend um, providing engagement with us, and then we can compensate you. An example of this is our equity advisor committee does have a compensation policy. Uh, and because of that in large part, and also for accessibility purposes, those meetings take place in the evenings. Um, so not we're not asking people to step aside from their, from their typical work day. Those are sort of after hours, which then opens us uh, the opportunity to compensate those individuals for participating. And then we also have a structured compensation policy for community-based organization that uh, allows us to have conversations with them about conditions in their communities and how we can help uh, be better partners to those communities. That compensation policy is um, set up to value their expertise almost in the way that we would pay a consultant um, to provide their expertise as well. So we we'll probably have some questions about this and I'm happy to delve into that a little bit more, but again, encourage you to take a, a look at that compensation policy in full. And then lastly, some questions to consider as you're looking to make engagement as easy as possible. Are you providing information and market materials in uh, multiple languages through a diverse array of sources? And did you do the research ahead of time to make sure that those are the most appropriate languages um, and sources that you should be using. Are meetings and open houses in different locations and at different times? You should be thinking critically about how those are scheduled and where they're located uh, to really uh, attract as much people as possible. Are you providing amenities such as childcare at public meetings? And if not, are you providing compensation so that individuals might be able to use that compensation to then pay for childcare? And lastly, are you facilitating different methods of input um, to account for social, economic, and cultural differences? And with that, thank you for um, attending today and listening to Gary and I speak. We'll be around for the Q&A after this, but in the meantime, I am going to stop my share uh, and hand it over to our colleague, Brooke Broad from the city of Bellevue. Great. Uh, so much. So um, I was invited to share about one of the approaches that the city of Bellevue is using to increase uh, participation from diverse audiences. And let me bring that up. And so, um, you know, we do a number of things to increase uh, participation from our different uh, communities throughout the city. Uh, but one of the ones we're especially proud of is um, the use of cultural outreach assistance. So these are, we have them currently for three different communities, our Latinx community, our South Asian community, and our Chinese community. Uh, these are folks who are uh, part-time staff. Um, they are people who really kind of are already embedded in the community. Um, when we hired them, we looked for folks who have, um, you know, connections already in the community, do a lot of volunteering. Um, many of these folks had either served on um, some of our uh, community boards, uh, they had volunteered at other aspects of kind of the things that the city do at our, our mini city hall. Um, they were involved in other community efforts. Um, they, uh, let's see, I think I have four things. Oh, there we go. Um, and really what I like to think about is that they're 
primary responsibility and role um, is relationship building with the community. And, uh, you know, we take that approach in part because of my own background. So I started out in this work as a community organizer um, and worked in a variety of different places around the country and around the state, um, particularly working um, with uh, marginalized communities. And ultimately, uh, community organizing is really all about uh, relationship building. And so that's what they focus on. Um, their overall responsibility. So um, they work five to eight hours a week. Uh, they are um, part-time variable staff with the city. Um, as I mentioned, their primary relationship, uh, their primary responsibility is uh, relationship building. So um, they, we set goals and do a lot of brainstorming on who they can have one-on-one -on -one meetings with. Those uh, meetings are often with just individuals or with folks who work at different community organizations. Um, uh, we then work together to leverage those relationships into opportunities for presentations, workshops, tabling, um, any other kind of community engagement opportunities. Our um, cultural outreach assistants will assist at events that are kind of more formal sponsored run by the city. Um, they'll do anything from helping to facilitate in another language to help people kind of go through a process. We don't ask them to do professional translation or interpretation. We hire them for that. But what they can do, which often a, uh, an interpreter can't do, is really that facilitation in another language. So um, they've done a lot of that. Um, we also work with them to promote opportunities to engage on language specific social media sites. Specifically, we um, do a lot of posting through our, our Chinese cultural outreach assistant on uh, WeChat, which is, I think, a really important uh, resource for us. Um, they also will review um, our translations for accuracy and readability. So if we do send something out for professional translation, they'll look at it and they'll make suggestions on changing the words or the orders or just kind of um, really give us a little bit of quality control. Um, some of the stuff that they've done specifically on uh, the comprehensive plan uh, work. So we launched back in February. And uh, since that time, we've had uh, three workshops, presentations, um, that have been done either for specific communities or in different languages. So here we, um, on, over to the left, we see some photos for one that we did for um, a Chinese youth leadership group. So those were all students um, from various middle and high schools from uh, mostly Bellevue um, who came to uh, learn about sort of city planning and just what it's like to work in city government. Um, and then below, we also um, earlier this year did uh, uh, an event uh, on the comprehensive plan entirely in Spanish. And that was really organized and led by our Spanish um, cultural outreach assistants. Um, you know, through the work of our cultural outreach assistants, um, we had really 125 questionnaire responses. So one of the first things that we did as part of our update was um, put out a, a questionnaire about the overall vision of the city. And so they were really instrumental in uh, getting additional language responses. Um, and as I said, they um, do a lot of ongoing relationship building. So, you know, Noah mentioned earlier, um, in his presentation about the importance of maintaining relationships. And so that's something that these cultural outreach assistants are really able to do. Um, some of the things that we're, we're learning, so you know, this started out as a, a pilot project on some a smaller scale neighborhood sub area planning. Um, and we found the results of that pilot were um, successful enough that we continue to use cultural outreach assistance on our comprehensive planning process. 
And I think one of the key benefits, again, of having those kind of consistent staff roles um, are that um, these folks can really help us maintain relationships. So they have check-ins with different community members. Um, they can kind of go back. We've found a lot of time. It, it takes one or two meetings, sometimes even more before uh, an organization is uh, willing to let us come and present or table at their location. So our cultural outreach assistants are able to make those kind of connections and build them over time. Um, again, it's ongoing, so they can continue to make those uh, relationships and continue to nurture them. Um, we have found it's really important to um, be flexible and adapt your approach to the way people self-organize. Right, so particularly on the east side, if we're reaching out to a group, um, you know, it's likely they're going to serve people across the the region. They're not just going to serve Bellevue residents. Um, and so, when our cultural outreach assistants are working with a different group or giving a presentation, we really don't um, make a lot of distinction between whether or not somebody is you know, a resident of Bellevue or they live in Kirkland or Redmond. Um, you know, we've also found for some communities, we've had to go outside of the Bellevue city limits to make those connections. Um, so we've done presenting at um, faith community centers that are located in Bothell um, because that's where a lot of our community members are going um, to, to worship. Um, so I think it's important to do that you know, to the extent that you can include questions on whatever, you know, your survey or your note taking or your sign in sheet that allows people to indicate where they do live. That way you can separate out sort of data or answers on the back end. Um, but that's really important. And then I think another really important lesson that we've learned is just around sharing the resources of our cultural outreach assistance. So, um, you know, our cultural outreach assistants don't just support the comprehensive plan. Um, they have um, helped promote um, community engagement work that our police department is using. They have helped support tabling or work for our environmental stewardship work. Um, they help out, they're gonna be helping out our economic development team. And I think one of the, the benefits that um, that um, has for uh, the program in general is that people uh, out in the community see our cultural outreach assistance as real broad resources for connecting um, to the city. So, um, and that also builds sort of trust. They really become these kind of known quantities out in the community. Also, like to be honest, there are times when we have um, slow periods during the comprehensive plan where we're not sort of out there. So this allows us to continue to kind of give consistent um, work and opportunities to our cultural outreach assistance. Um, and uh, I think uh, that I, I kept my slides really short. Uh, I'm sure we'll uh, deal with some questions in the Q&A period, but um, also happy to have more conversations with people about how we um, set up this program and um, offline at any time. So I guess with that, I uh, turn things back over to you, Maxie. Fantastic. Thank you, Brooke, and thank you to our other presenters. So we are going to uh, dive back into questions. So Brooke, I have a couple for you as we get started, and then I'll open them up more broadly. Uh, so the first is, um, do community outreach assistants seem to be accompanied by staff members with program expertise as they're getting those questions in? Or maybe what does that relationship look like? Um, yeah, so I would say for the most part, when it comes to sort of the one-on-one -on -one or relationship building, they, they don't need to involve me or any staffers. So sometimes I will um, come to a meeting that they've set up if they want me there, but... Um, you know, we give them a lot of, uh, through their onboarding background uh, training on what the comprehensive plan is, why it's important, so they can really kind of communicate that out. And then oftentimes I will attend um, an event just in case they get a question from a community member. 
um, about some other aspect of the city work that they just don't know the answer to. So I'm kind of always on hand for kind of moral support, setting up the chairs, answering a question that they won't be able to answer. But, you know, I really consider myself kind of more in the background. You know. Fantastic. Um, another question on the compensation level for community members or the connectors as well. Um, maybe if you have specific numbers or another way of talking about compensation. Um, yeah, so um, as I mentioned, these guys are um, part-time uh, staff, part-time staff. So when we initially set up the program, we looked at some different um, structures. So we had thought about doing some independent contracting with people. Um, and then in discussion with our human resources um, department, they said, well, these folks actually have to be employees, given the way that um, they're working with me in particular in the amount of supervision or connection that they have with staff. So, um, you know, we worked with our human services department to um, identify what the right class and hourly rate is. Um, so, and, you know, they, they get some prorated sick time, they get prorated, you know, things into our retirement program, but they um, are hired as part-time variable staff with the city. They have city badges, city-issued um, laptops. Great. Uh, another one. So what strategies have you used to recruit these assistants or promote the position? Uh, yeah, so um, this we really did, um, even though they are sort of official staff and, you know, we put a requisition into NeoGov and all those systems, we really didn't um, do kind of more formal, put it out on LinkedIn or a, a job description board. Um, you know, we worked with community partners. We worked a lot with our human services um, department. Um, you know, we have a number of different sort of boards and commissions related to youth and related to diversity. So uh, we had a pretty simple one page um, kind of explanation of um, the planning department work and the responsibilities. And we gave that out to um, nonprofit leaders. We gave it out to our human services department. Um, I just sort of gave it to every single person. The application process, um, I didn't ask, I didn't require people to um, send me a resume because I didn't want people to feel like they needed to be some kind of professional community organizer. They were simply asked to um, tell me a little bit about kind of the volunteering or whatever work they do in the community now, why they were interested in the role, and maybe a little bit about, you know, if they have any public speaking or presenting experience. And then um, myself and um, other members of our planning uh, team would do some informal conversation. But mostly it was through recommendations and, and word of mouth that we, we found. Great, thank you. Uh, so now I have a few questions. I'm going to open it up more broadly, but would love, Brooke, if you have answers to these two. So the first is that, um, so our city uses Google Translate on our website for information we post there on our planning projects. Is this a good way to go or do you have suggestions for another approach? So I'm happy to take the first um, sort of pass at this um, and then maybe broke for some context as well. So what we do at PSRC, we have um, consultant contracts for translating and we also have a lot of in-house staff that have language skills. Sometimes we use Google Translate and then we'll run it um, by some of our staff members to kind of correct with that. I think Google Translate is kind of an imperfect way to get um, you know, broad general information out, but it's not very nuanced. And I would just kind of return to our conversation um, when Gary talked about uh, the spectrum of public participation. If you're using Google Translate, it might be an appropriate way to um, get that information out. So sort of sticking in that inform category, but I would encourage you to think about different ways that you could move past that to collect information back and work that nuance in to think about how to engage and empower rather than just putting that in form out there. So um, yeah, maybe do a maybe do like a review of staff language skills if if a budget is a constraint um, and see if there's staff time to help with that or or think about looking into a, a consultant to contract with. Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, as we um, prepared for our comp plan update, we tried to make an estimate of all the things that we might want or need translated or so an explanatory 
flyer, a trans, you know, a presentation, I think it's good to start with thinking, what are some baseline sort of general overview, explanatory materials that you will need and get those professionally translated? I mean, you know, particularly, I mean, Google Translate is particularly, I think, or notoriously not great at um, translating um, Asian languages or languages that don't use a Roman alphabet. Um, and so, and since, um, you know, those are languages, you know, Chinese that are particularly prevalent in um, Bellevue, we didn't feel comfortable using Google Translate for anything other than like a sentence or something. Like, so sometimes if I'm short something, you know, that's just a sentence or two. Um, we do have some staff who will um, volunteer to do a quick translate or something, but as a rule in our city, we don't um, want to ask staff to do something that's more than like a paragraph because it's just not fair for them. They have full-time jobs. They have other responsibilities and we don't want them sort of being kind of taken advantage of um, in terms of their time. Yeah, great, Natasha, go ahead. I just had a thought. Um, so we were, you know, smaller, relatively medium sized city. I know there's probably even smaller cities out there. We have done some translation of some of our, our documents into Chinese and Spanish. You're all welcome to use those. Um, and maybe there's other jurisdictions, other entities who have things that ask questions that could be utilized by smaller entities that don't have a lot of budget. So I, I, I put that out there. Um, you're gonna have some specific things that maybe you want, but if there's you know more general questions, maybe that's something that we could be thinking about as a, as a resource for folks. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. I think we could help compile some of those as well at PSRC. Uh, so I've got one more question here, and I think it's kind of a big one. So I'm like interested, maybe Natasha, do you have some experience with this? Brooke, and maybe Charles, you have an answer. So when working for a more conservative community where some residents view equity as a divisive topic, do you have suggestions on um, how to do this work without setting off a political firestorm? Or I think in other words, how do I inspire my community to value equity? It's another way this question was phrased. I'll take a I'll take a stab at it. Um, the the point that came to mind when I saw uh, that question was a book uh, entitled "The Some of Us" by Heather McGee. Um, I think she's done a fantastic job of really highlighting uh, different approaches that can be taken to have these conversations and these uh, firestorms, and really highlighting how we're doing our entire region and our entire communities a disservice by. Uh, not addressing equity. Um, it's not a zero sum game. And she uses the example of uh, desegregation um, and this uh, desire to uh, desegregate pools. And at that time, there was a lot of resistance to desegregate those pools. Um, and as a result of that, many cities across the country uh, drained those pools and filled them with cement, um, obviously hurting themselves uh, in opposition of more equitable policies. Um, I think that's kind of an example that really highlights uh, the uh, perception and the stance that many communities are taking when they're not being thoughtful about equi equity um, and having a firestorm in response to equitable policies. Um, research shows time and time again that uh, equity is not a zero sum game. We can grow the economy as a result of more equitable policies, um, tapping into the full brilliance of every corner of our, our region and allowing those innovative ideas to uh, spawn new opportunities for many uh, communities across uh, the region. So um, when I was in Connecticut advocating for affordable housing and issues of homelessness, that was an approach that I tried to take was to really tap into what are the hesitations, the resistance to affordable housing, to homelessness, and what did the research say um, related to those different topics and having some real conversations um, to kind of dispel those myths. And I, I think that was pretty, pretty helpful. And um, I'll stop there and I'll let uh, Brooke share her experience. Yeah, I mean, I would say there, there's two pieces of advice I would sort of give. And one is, um, A, just think about how, how you're setting up your engagement to begin with, right? So 
you know, I think if we set up engagement where it's more public meeting style and people are going to get their two minutes to say their piece um, and get on their soapbox, what you're going to have is a lot of people getting up and advocating for a particular position or feeling like they they have this limited amount of time to get their points across. Um, whereas if you can arrange for things to be more small group dialogue and having people actually have to talk to each other and deliberate, um, you know, and uh, create some uh, empathy <laughs> among people. Um, I think that's really important. I think, you know, another thing that we have done in some of our um, in-person engagement is, um, you know, this was a suggestion from a, a colleague um, who pointed me in this direction, and it's usually a technique that's often used in public health called um, data walks. So we often started out a lot of our just kind of more discussion-based uh, engagement on the comp plan with a data walk where we shared things that often had equity data on it, along with a range of other data, like who had access to frequent transit, who historical timelines that explain some of the exclusionary policies on housing and how they've impacted us today, um, and allow people just to, to take that in on their own time and then enter into a discussion. So again, I think to the extent that you can help people not just have an opinion, but have an informed opinion, um, those are our two things. And then I would say like, if there is somebody, this is like my community organizer, like if you have somebody who's like getting up on their soapbox and making a lot of opinions known and, and trying to dominate a conversation, like go offer to meet them for coffee and like dig in and understand more about where their fears are coming from, like what is causing, because most of this stuff is coming out of a fear, as Charles was saying, that there's zero sum game and that they're going to lose some piece of a pie, right? So that would be my other suggestion is just keep an eye on those people who are, you know, writing in or commenting or getting on their soapbox and, and try to get to know them. You don't have to change their mind. You just need to get to understand why they feel the way they feel. Um, just maybe one other thought. Um, I mean, it depends on your community, your council, but I think one of the reasons that um, PSRC really started focusing on equity is because uh, we have board members that were very um, interested in this topic and really like wanted to provide that leadership. So it isn't, uh, wasn't necessarily just like, oh, the staff wants to do this or um, that we had some more kind of leadership from our board and our elected officials. So um, I think it's it, it would be an interesting conversation for you to start also with your, your council about kind of understanding where they're at and sort of trying to understand if they can also sort of provide some leadership on this issue and, um, and provide kind of a voice too. I, if I could just jump in here, I, I I really, I know we don't have much time here. I, I really agree with all of that and I appreciate everything that Brooke said. I will note, as we talked about relationships, that these people, as was noted, want to be heard and they have concerns and issues and their definition of equity is not as broad. So when you're talking to these people, you, you're not forgetting them. You're still listening to them. They're still important. Their issues are still there. You still care. You're still listening, you hear them, and you're broadening their definition of equity. It's not you're doing this and it's it's a win-win you're looking for, and it's perceived as a win-lose for a lot of folks, I think. Fantastic. Thank you for ending us on that. So I am just that is the end of the questions we had come in. If you have more, you can always email us at our plan review email here on the screen. Um, or all of the presenters' contact information will be included in those slides posted on our website, and we'll send out a link to all of those when they're available along with the recording. Um, we are going to close out with a couple more poll questions just to see how you are feeling after today's event and if you have any direct feedback for us. So if we could launch those questions. Um, and then when today's event ends, you will be prompted to take a survey just asking um, some demographic information. This helps us um, with some of our Title VI work and just to have a better understanding of who's joining us today. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, we will leave these questions up for a little bit and please feel free to be in touch if you have any questions.